For our next session, we are very happy to have with us Lord Meghnath Desai and Dr. Urjit Patel in the session, Yours Truly, Meghnath Desai. Lord Meghnath Desai was associated for 38 years with the London School of Economics, where he was a professor of economics and director of the Center for the Study of Global Governance. He was elevated to the House of Lords in June 1991. He is currently chairman of the advisory board of the official Monetary and Financial Institutions Forum. He has written over 30 books on economics, history, politics, and cinema, as well as fiction. He received the Pravasi Bharatiya Puraskar in 2004 and Padma Bhushan in 2008. Dr. Urjit Patel is the chairman of the National Institute of Public Finance and Policy. He was the governor of the Reserve Bank of India from 2016 to 18. Prior to public service, he worked in various capacities in the private sector at Reliance Industries Limited and at Infrastructure Development Finance Company. He has also worked at the International Monetary Fund and is an author of Overdraft, Saving the Indian Saver, published by HarperCollins in July. Before we uh, ask uh, our esteemed speakers to take over, I would request a movie to be played. He pursues controversies in economics, history, and anything else which catches his attention. He has written over 30 books on economics, as well as fiction, over 200 articles in learned journals, and several newspaper columns in UK and India. Moreover, he is also a British parliamentarian sitting in the House of Lords, and it is quite famously known that he was the first non-British person to ever stand for this position. Presenting to you Padma Bhushan, Lord Meghna Desai. Born to middle-class parents in Vadodara, Gujarat, Desai grew up in an India that was still shiny and new and filled with every kind of potential. But seeking fresh academic challenges, he left for the US and then the UK quite certain that his future lay elsewhere. As he participated in the student protest that spread across the Western world in 1968-69, his political energy and ideas began to find focus. This was also perhaps the root of his unorthodox approach towards economics. In the year 1990 and 1992, he founded two essential institutes, namely the Center for Study of Global Governance and the Development Studies Institute as well as the Development Studies Program of London School of Economics. He retired as Emeritus Professor of Economics and was made Honorary Fellow of the London School of Economics. He is also one of the creators of the Human Development Index, an inclusive index that quantifies development. Some of his books which make him a very prolific writer are Rethinking Islamism, Ideology of the New Terror 2006, The Route to All Evil, the Political Economy of Ezra Pound, 2007, A Novel, Dead of Time, 2009, and The Rediscovery of India, 2009. His interests are quite wide-ranging, from Marxism and literature to fiction and film studies. In India, he established the Meghna Desai Academy of Economics with a vision to create a class of young economists who would be industry-ready when they leave the academy and look for jobs. He is also the chairman of the official Monetary and Financial Institutions Forum Advisory Board, a financial enterprise. Mr. Desai also loves to cook and shuttles between London, Delhi and Goa. Mr. Desai's life definitely stands testimony to the fact that no dream is too big to be accomplished and no dream is too small to be dismissed or discarded. And it proves the fact that there is never an age when one becomes too old to learn new things or to discover innovative enterprises which will help in making one's life meaningful. Lord Desai received the Pravasi Bharatiya Puraskar in 2004 and the Padma Bhushan in 2008. PILF is honored to welcome Lord Meghna Desai. Hello, Rajit. 
Hello, Rajit. How are you? Hi, hi. Uh, do we uh, do we take it over from now? Let us. Let us. Yes, I think we. Should. <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, you know, I would just like to uh, uh, add a couple of things uh, to that uh, uh, to that fine introduction of uh, of Lord Magna Desai. Uh, uh, and yeah, you know, uh, this is uh, from the perspective of an economist that uh, uh, he, um, uh, there are very few uh, people I know, uh, academics whose uh, uh, who's, uh, uh, books on as diverse uh, subjects as, uh, as, as Marxian economic theory uh, and testing monetarism uh, uh, would be uh, uh, would be on the reading list of uh, of, of students, both undergraduate and graduate, uh, and that uh, that conveys the uh, eclectic uh, rigor of of, of Lord Desai. Uh, uh, and uh, I would also like to mention uh, uh, the the widely read column that uh, that he he writes, uh, uh, which. Uh, uh, true to his form, he calls it out of my mind, uh, which is anything but out of his mind. Uh, 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 and uh, uh, he, uh, he he offers advice uh, and suggests solutions uh, in these columns. They are not uh, they are not of the usual uh, kind, which is uh, often just a litany of uh, of, of problems and criticisms. Uh, uh, he also uh, 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 continues to give hands-on support uh, for the Magnite Desai Academy of Economics, uh, which is which is an important uh, postgraduate institution uh, uh, for uh, aspiring professional economists, uh, and uh, and it has gone uh, from strength to strength uh, with uh, with uh, with uh, with a very reputable placement record of its graduates. Uh, so uh, uh leaving uh, leaving that aside let me uh, let me turn to uh, to his uh, to his book uh, uh which is uh, which is this one magna desai rebellious lord uh which i actually finished reading this week uh and uh, and it's uh, it's it's a very clearly written book uh it's compact uh, just 280 pages uh, highly readable enjoyable, uh, uh, something you can read over a lazy weekend uh, uh, because, uh, uh, because it's short enough uh, and, uh, and, and very easy to follow. Uh, uh, it, is, uh, it is devoid of technical jargon, uh, uh, and, uh, and it really is a very, uh, uh, very engaging and candid uh, uh, autobiography of, of Lord Desai. Uh, he has... Uh, uh, he, he, he has been kind to almost everyone in the book, and he has not uh, uh, insulted anyone. Uh, and uh, and and yet uh, and yet the book is uh, is candid, and and it and therefore uh, therefore a fine read. And I I highly recommend it uh, for 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 many people uh, in all walks of life. Uh, uh, what you what you also get. Uh, from reading his book, that uh, uh, that he's free of dogma, which people who have known him in policy circles know uh, when it comes to economic policies. Uh, but he generally doesn't favor uh, government intervention much, especially in individual markets, uh, 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 and 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 that also is developed in his book uh, from his early days in college. Uh, uh, I will turn to uh, you know some some other things later, but I, I would uh, uh, you know I was thinking that if if one were to do a functional uh, uh, classification of your book, uh, Lord Desai, uh, it would essentially be uh, college and graduate school, uh, research and teaching, uh, and 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 theater uh, 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 for for uh, the first half of your life and. Ah. Uh, and uh, I, I had wanted to, uh, uh, you know, uh, you to talk about that because uh, 
uh, uh, until you joined uh, active politics in 1971 uh, or thereabouts uh, by becoming a member of the Labour Party, uh, you were very much engaged in theatre. And uh, and and you know, if if you could if you could say some things on that, and in particular Gujarati theatre, you you did a fair Indeed. bit in that. Indeed. Yes. No, my it is it is one of my one of my great great losses, but gives me great delight. When I was in college, uh, in Ria College in, in Mumbai, we used to have an intercollegiate uh, one-act play competition organized by Kala Kendra. And uh, I got involved on the Gujarati uh, play side because uh, I was very precocious in wandering around uh, the Bombay University Library. I came across Ibsen, Henrik Ibsen, uh, the Norwegian playwright. And I read his play, uh, Doll's House, and I was completely knocked out. It's a three act play, it's a very, almost a revolutionary play about women's uh, liberation. And so I thought I have to translate this in Gujarati and I have to stage it. Uh, so I took the third act, which is climactic, and translated it into Gujarati, adapted it, like we used to say, and then persuaded my college uh, and my college's uh, mates to stage it. Uh, I didn't act in it, but I just wrote the play and I was in backstage and so on. And that proved to be very successful. It, it got into the finals and we got a couple of prizes. We didn't get the trophy, but that kind of, I got the drama bug, theater bug. And then I adapted uh, Tennessee Williams's play, The Glass Menagerie. Uh, and then later on, uh, that, that did very well. And then later on, I adapted Dial M for Murder, which was made into a film by uh, Alfred Hitchcock. And as luck would have it, uh, my, my friend who used to act had gone away. So I had to act in it as well. So I was the chief, I was the lead actor. I was uh, the writer and uh, you know, listless director because my friend who was directing couldn't, couldn't say it openly. Anyway, and we got a trophy. So I had a I had an accidental good fortune of being able to be successful in theater. So then when I left uh, India and went to America, again, as luck would have it, very early on in my stay in Philadelphia, I got in touch with a suburban theater, the mainline playhouse. And suddenly there I was among lots of American families uh, who were theater uh, sort of enthusiast. So I acted a few sort of small parts in that. And I saw a side of American life, which most students who go there to study never see. They never get uh, you know, friendly with, 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 uh, with American families, you know, middle class, uh, sort of fairly prosperous middle class American families. And uh, so, and then of course it went on when I came to uh, London, someone says, well, I helped them do a Gujarati, uh, the help in the Gujarati theater. So I said, yes, I helped them in the Gujarati theater. So that all continued. Then as you say, at 70, uh, in 1971, A, I was married, I was I joined the Labour Party, I had my go job, I ran out of time. But uh, I, I still would say that it was a great, great experience in my life to have theater because it is an amazing thing. There you are and you never know how one day will go from next. One day you're a success, second day you're a failure. So there's a lot of, a uh, lot of sort of improvisation and uh, nerves and sort of uh, some talent. Uh, great, great, great fun. Theater is great fun. I, I'd love someday to go back to it, but I don't know there are any parts for old uh, gray head, uh, uh, fat people, but I'm here. <laughs> right. Yeah. I, the the other uh, 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 part of the book uh, where uh, you have spent a fair bit of time uh, uh, describing uh, your journey uh, uh, was uh, was this uh, uh, left wing uh, student politics, uh, both at uh, Berkeley and at LSE, and. Uh, uh, I think because you became a faculty at a very uh, very young age, uh, you identified more with students, uh, uh, and, and and therefore uh, while being uh, a faculty, you uh, uh, you were engaged in student uh, uh, not politics, but uh, but in their uh, uh, in their interests and their causes, uh, 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 and uh, uh, and in, and. 
uh, is there anything in particular which made you s uh, switch from uh, uh, just being at university and uh, and uh, supporting and espousing some of the causes to take you formally yeah. into into po into political uh, uh, to a political party i i don't know what it was but you know how in india when you grow up you're always told to be cautious you know not not do anything draws any attention no politics at a young age you know just stay uh, you know, stay kind of you know stay close to your studies and so on but in america i was on my own there was nobody to stop me and once i'd finished my phd i was still quite young i was only 23 when i finished my phd and i got to berkeley i had a job and all that but then i began to feel that maybe i will settle down in america and i began to see the problems there especially problems of race and the civil rights movement was active at that time and berkeley is a very lively campus so i started demonstrating against discrimination in hiring in supermarkets you know this was a very small thing you stand outside with a placard and and go around saying you know you know hire black people or whatever uh, and then of course the students had this, their own rebellion in berkeley one of the first in a in a uh, from in the post war period it was called the free speech movement and i just you know i was not a student i was not even a teacher i was a research officer but i got to know them because as you said you know i always felt that i'm the same age as them and they also felt that you know i was i was just one, one of them uh, and so i could understand what they were talking about i could understand that the the needs and and their, and their complaints so i kind of drifted along then the anti vietnam war movement started and there i had no doubt coming from india i had no doubt where the justice lay and i knew it was with the vietnamese you know, the north vietnamese people and ho chi minh and all that so it it just followed from that that i became involved in student uh, politics but students were not just complaining about their own uh, lives but they also so complaining about the society in which they were living and they were young they had good ideas and so i learned a lot from them when i came to london again the same became the, i was sort of 25 the day sort of, you know in the late 19 teens or 20s and it all became very friendly so i began to uh, sympathize uh, with their causes and they liked my help so they made me chairman of the students union on the rich chairman of the students union and i got involved in the sit in and all that i described but you know that gave me a very good way of getting into politics uh, into into labor party politics because i had taken part in a kind of actively as you were joining the people and uh, and and marching with them and that that's a very i didn't just come from above uh, I, i i came with them uh, and and that is always a good thing in politics always be part of uh, of the movement before you think you're going to get on top of that you can't just come from the top no that you i mean uh, see... sorry that's uh, that's uh, you described uh, your uh, 20 years of uh, of being a foot soldier in the party before you <laughs> you got elevated as lord and uh, you have described how uh, you went uh, door to door canvassing uh, uh, yeah. not only before the election but on the day of the election uh, to remind people yeah. uh, who had promised that they would vote for your party that uh, that they needed to do so and uh, uh, and and you know that is that is hard work uh, unpaid that's uh, uh, you have not Maybe. been paid uh, i think a penny for <laughs> for uh, for uh, or decades of work for a labor, for the political party uh, uh, yeah. even as a lord uh, there is uh, there's just an allowance no stipend as such uh, no, no, so no. Salary, salary, no. yeah yeah okay, so it's just, uh, just a no no the interesting correct. thing uh, in, about about politics and i always uh, i always wonder whether in india they have political parties like we have you know we used to meet every month at a ward level at the at the constituency level and we used to have political discussions you know quite regular meeting and many of the people were there who had no idea they would get into parliament or they were not there for a ticket and like that and also doing this uh, you know going from door to door two things i learned more about how ordinary british people live 
you know, in a day to day, what are the day to day complaints? Can can the political party do something about that? And so I wasn't sitting in an ivory tower having left wing dreams of how to reorder society. I actually had done the footwork. And, you know, secondly, it, it's a, it's one of those things which tells you that a lot of political work is voluntary and you do it as part of your desire to change society. And, uh, and, and for me, it was it's the most practical thing I've done. Being an academic, I didn't have to do anything practical, but I learned how to fight elections. I can tell you, I can still give me a seat to fight and I know exactly what to do. And I was, you know, I fought, I did, I did that for about 30 years. And uh, that, that was very, very educational. I, I, you know, I used to meet people at LSE at lunch and so on. And they'll tell me all sorts of fancies. Oh, I'm too left wing to join the Labour Party. You know, I have this idea, that idea. They've never been out of the out of the door and and gone to a, a council estate and seen how people live. I have. Uh, I didn't tell them that, but uh, I always used to laugh at this fellow, left wingery or right wingery, whatever it was. You have to be in there with the people. Politics is to be with the people. It's very important. Yeah, it's it's very. Um, uh, it was quite moving that, uh, in a way, you were uh, you you took more pride in becoming the chairman of your local uh, wing of the <laughs> Labour Party uh, than than being life peer, because in a in a way, uh, uh, you know, that was uh, uh, that was an endorsement for uh, from people who you rub shoulders with. Uh, in doing uh, party and political so, work, in a, in a sense, I was I was without doubt, the first non-white uh, chairman of my party. But nobody remarked on that. I was not made chairman because I was non-white. I was made chairman because I was one of them. They had seen me working hard and, you know, I got elected by the party. And, you know, and this is a this is a pretty tough party because they're always quarreling with each other. But no, and for six years, I, I was, uh, I was a very popular and successful chairman, I can say. And that was, that was fun because it was a cause I had to, uh, you know, I had to advance and I did. I was not an MP. I was not a councillor. I was just in a party. I, I, you know, uh, uh, one of the things you mentioned in the book is that if you had uh, uh, lived and, and pursued a career in India, you would have probably joined the Swatantra party. Um, uh, 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 you, it, it's, a, it's a cryptic paragraph. That uh, that in hindsight yeah, you, would, you would have probably joined yeah, them. It's very interesting. It was at the end of my MA uh, MA years. I, I finished my MA in uh, uh, 1960, uh, and uh, the Swatantra Party was founded at that time, and in the Merchants Chamber, uh, just outside Church Gate Station, there was this meeting, and Vimini Masani was there, and uh, Jayaprakash Narayan came. So I went there because the only occasion on which I was able to hear Jay Prakash Narayan, and uh, although Jay Prakash Narayan was not going to join the Satantra Party, he took the view, which I very much agree, that there ought to be diversity of political opinion in the party political structure. Even if you don't want to be a Satantra, then be a Satantra Party. At that time, I was sufficiently right wing to want to join it because I had read about Macmillan and the Conservative Party and their success in 1959 and all that. And, uh, you know, at that time, even Panditji was getting a little bit uh, stale uh, for, for us youngster people because uh, we weren't getting anywhere as far as in economic uh, uh, progress. But so I certainly went out of curiosity. I did not join. Maybe had I lived in India, I would have joined. Of course, my family would have told me not to join, take the IAS, why do you want to do politics, and so on. Of course, once I was away from the family, I could do what I liked. Uh, but, you know, I, I really did think, and even now I think, that uh, there is a missing dimension in Indian politics. No political party in India actually likes businessmen. Seriously, they don't actually think businessmen do good things, you know, and then nobody, no political leader will say profits are a good thing, profits create jobs. No, 
right? All profits are always bad and monopolistic mm. and big corporate and this and that. And you know, it's a, there's a reluctance to take a view of the market, which we live in practice. We go out there and shop in the free market. There's no other thing to to do. Your onions are not made by by, by the government corporations, <laughs> and we still don't actually agree that markets are a good thing. And this is not a left wing thing. From left to right, from RSS to CPM or CPMLM, uh, nobody likes business. And I, I find it very strange. In UK politics or even in US politics, people have a different criticism about the business, but by and large they know that we have an economy based on private sector, on competition, we need to improve competition. We need to kind of monitor competition. We need to take uh, pro make provision for welfare state things, health, education. But you're not going to be able to do without businessmen and business women, I should say, business people. And uh, so the market has a big contribution to make, whether you're socialist or not. True. I, I, I mean, the link between uh, profits, taxes, and social welfare expenditure and, and income support uh, uh, that uh, uh, that you know that that link uh, is is something which is uh, 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 which is very strong and 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 without the first end in that production pipeline there is very little to redistribute at the end exactly absolutely uh, yeah so yeah, I, uh, was, I i championed basic income citizens income I have been championing citizens' income for about uh, 50 years now in British politics. It's a distant dream but because I'm always aware that there is always a cost. Can you afford it? Uh, yes. you, you can't just have a dream like that. But I've always championed uh, citizens' income because that's the most radical way of financing a welfare state. Right, right. Uh, um... I, I don't know how much time uh, the two of us have, but one of the things uh, that struck me, uh, uh, Lord Desai, is that in your book, uh, you know, over your uh, over your entire uh, career in in the various fields, uh, you you actually never, uh, and I, I and you know, knowing you, I, I know that's the truth. You you never mention uh, racism coming in your way. Uh, uh, at your personal level, and, and you know, uh, 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 but recently uh, you you stepped down, uh, 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 or you rather gave up your party affiliation. You continue to be lord. Uh, you gave up your party affiliation on uh, grounds of uh, racism. Uh, do you want to say yeah. anything on that? Yeah, because your, your book ends before that. Yeah. I think both both in America and in UK, and many people find this hard to believe, I've never faced racism. I've never faced any kind of discrimination, obstruction, nothing like that. Uh, in America, you know, you know, more or less people people know you're not black American, then you're all right, you know. Uh, and then the kind of, uh, and I had, I had no problem going to this mainline playhouse, fa white families and so on, they, they adopted me. Uh, in UK, I always taken the view that to some extent, it is, are you willing to merge? Are you yourself willing to merge with, with the natives as it were? Or do you want to go to your own ghetto and live with your own people? I've always wanted to merge among the natives, no problem. And if you have a middle class income, you know, class matters as well as race. And so to get given to, and at, at work, of course, London School of Economics, you know, nobody ever thought about race. As far as I know, I never had any racial problems. And uh, I, I wouldn't say, oh, you know, they promoted a white man before me. No, they promoted on merits, and they were good judges of marriage. When I sat in judgment on other people, I followed the same policy. And in the Labour Party, at no stage in the Labour Party did anybody ever uh, comment on it or prevent me. I was just, I was just making that I happened to be working at a, as a lecturer and let's go. So, but I am very strongly anti-racist. 
And because the Labour Party had lately got into anti-Semitism, very virulent kind of anti-Semitism because of, uh, you know, the, the social media and so on, people abusing uh, Jewish MPs, especially women. And we had suffered from that. We lost the election. And then it still continued to be that we were not tackling it very much. So I suddenly thought, I've had enough of this. Uh, you know, I really can't be in a party where I'm ashamed to be in the party because what of other people are doing. And we have not actually succeeded in establishing our anti-racist credentials. And lots of people told me, please don't do this. Please don't go away. You know, we value you. Stay in and fight. And I sort of said, you know, I have done all this. I've, I've been in a party 49 years. I'm, 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 not, I'm not going away in, a, in, a, in, a, in any kind of short while. I thought, no, I have to declare that I'm out of this. And as and when the party does become free of anti-Semitism, I will rejoin if they will have me. But right now, I'm not going to be there. That's my stance. So you, you sit in the neutral benches, uh, you know, you know. Yeah, uh, I sit on what's called cross benches. Cross uh, benches, right? Cross benches. Yes, okay. uh, we're, we're, all of us have no party affiliation. Either right, we have thrown right. out of parties, or we have resigned from parties, or very often right. people are appointed to the House of Lords for the general, whether they're, they're judges or or you know, sort of actors or whatever it is. They they don't have a party political affiliation. They're just distinguished people. So so they right. sit on the cross bench. Right, right. Um, uh, shall we take some questions now uh, if, uh, if, from the audience? If uh, uh, if the moderator can uh, uh, can see to that, please. Mm -hmm. How impactful is behavior behavioral economics? Well, you know, to the current business environment. Uh, frankly, uh, I don't know the truthful answer to this question because I'm not in a business environment. And I'm not a behavioral economist. But what I do know is that governments have been very much influenced by what's called the nudge theory, how to make people change their habits, which would, which would help either reduce pollution or improve health, especially the, the British government very much went in for the nudge uh, idea. And, uh, you know, while I was, uh, I was as a practicing economics, Behavioral economics was uh, coming up in the early 60s. Uh, a, a, man, a man called Simon, Herbert Simon, uh, at, um, at Pittsburgh. And so I read a lot of behavioral economics at that time, but I never became a behavioral economist. Recently, it has come back into, into, uh, into fashion. And I think, you know, good, you know, if people want to do economics that way, very good. And it is a kind of a practical economics, practical applied economics. I don't agree with the critique of uh, traditional economics, but that is that's a that's a minor dispute. No, I think it, it is it is influential, and it is one of those things. Uh, like for example, uh, uh, just to take a trivial example, perhaps uh, take outside defecation or or spitting. You could use behavioral economics to improve that. I'm, I'm not going to advise government if India do it, but they could find out how to do it using behavioral economics, and that would be very helpful. Uh, any other are there other questions? Uh, well, wh why do uh, uh, one of the we have why to you stand them into silence? So it, yes. if we get some no time, we can talk more. We can talk. Uh, so, uh, uh, Lord Desai, I wanted to uh, uh, just bring you back uh, to one thing. Uh, though you, you know, you 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 said that uh, you uh, you sort of merged into into British society and, and you know had a political career there. Uh, uh, but one of the fine things that you did uh, was uh, uh, was uh, uh, was being the force behind uh, uh, the statue of Gandhiji at the Westminster oh, Palace yes. and uh, if you if you want to say a few things on that because I think uh, that's one of a that's a great gesture the only other uh, uh, Gandhiji statue that I had seen in London was uh, just off Southampton Row you know in a very small yeah. park 
Yeah, uh, very small. Uh, park, yeah, very small park. <laughs> so, if you want to say something on that, no, no, it, it's also very much an example of uh, being deeply integrated into uh, into uh, uh, British politics and also how it is important. Uh, Joe Johnson, uh, brother of uh, the present Prime Minister, uh, used to be the Financial Times correspondent in India, and so I got to know him there and. Uh, my wife Kishwar and and he and his wife uh, we used to meet socially and uh, and so when when I was uh, I mean in, back in London in 2014 uh, I suddenly got a call from um, Joe Joe at that time was in the cabinet office he was an MP he was in the cabinet office uh, and Cameron was the prime minister so he said Meghnad would it be a good idea to have a statue of Gandhi in uh, Parliament Square. And obviously, to the leading question, I said, "Of course, it will be a great, great idea." So he says, "Would you, would you please set up a, a help, help raise money for it? Because uh, all statues in Parliament Square are financed by public subscription. Government pays no money uh, for for any of these statues." I said, "Fine, uh, I will do it. Let's let's uh, see." So then I became part of this conservative government, uh, or actually the coalition government at that time, a coalition government, conservative Lib Dem, uh, to set up a Gandhi statue. And I was going to be the chairman of the trust set up, charity trust set up, to raise money. So it was kind of all party effort. But uh, I, I didn't for a moment think that I'm not going to have this conservative government, nothing like that. So I became, uh, I became chairman. We, we had a launch of the trust at the at the at the Birla House where Gandhiji uh, was assassinated, along with um, uh, uh, William William Hague, uh, Foreign Minister, and George Osborne, and the, the the Chancellor of the Exchequer. And then I started raising money. And I, as I account in in my in my uh, autobiography, it was quite quite hard work to to raise a, kind of a million and a half pounds in in six months. And it was people from India who were the most helpful, really, really very helpful. You know, um, and then Narayan Murthy, Rahul Bajaj, uh, and sort of people of that sort. Uh, in Infosys gave money, and and so I was able to collect uh, all this money. Uh, in other people helped. My, my wife helped, and lots of other people helped. And we were able to, and then the government had already selected the sculptor, who's a lovely, lovely sculptor, Philip Jackson. We had this uh, uh, statue, and we were able to inaugurate it on March the fifteenth, uh, uh, twenty fifteen. Uh, in March twenty fifteen, uh, and um, Arun Jaitley came. Arun Jaitley came because I'm sad to say, uh, and I don't see this say in the book. Uh, the Labour Party came to Delhi and argued that um, you know, the, the Prime Minister should not go because it would only help the Conservatives win the election. Uh, they, they made a partisan uh, go. So I said, you know, okay, you want to do that, you want to do that, you know, what can I say about this? So Arun Jaitley came. And, uh, and of course, Amitabh Bachchan was there. Thankfully, he was very, very helpful. And then Gopal Gandhi was there. And we had, we had really a great opening of, of the statue. And that is, I think, one of my proudest achievements that I was able to do this and set it up. And there it is forever and ever. And it is in a very central position in Parliament Square itself. It is Gandhi tall looking at the gates to the Parliament. Actually, it's not very far away. He's looking out to the sea from where the Germans are going to come. Gandhi is keeping an eye on parliament. And I, I felt very proud that I was able to help do that. And in the book, you describe the symbolism of, uh, of the placement of the statue between Jan Schmutz and Nelson Mandela. <clears throat> yes. Uh, which I think uh, was also a nice, uh, nice touch uh, uh, given the Given the politics with which Gandhiji had started and uh, absolutely. and absolutely. and argued with Jan Schwartz, I, I noticed it. Well, you know, I I had noticed that Mandela statue was already there, and I had been thinking on my own, why is the Gandhi statue there? 
And so when the when the invitation came, I thought, of course, we want a Gandhi statue. <clears throat> but when people haven't actually noticed uh, the Mandela statue there. You know, recently there is this fashion of saying Gandhi was a racist and all that. And there was this Black Lives Matter demonstration and they wanted to do. But nobody noticed uh, Jan Smuts. The real racist was not noticed at all. You know, <laughs> and you know, Smuts stands there. And you know, he's all right, but Churchill is bad and Gandhi is bad and Mandela is bad. And I thought, such ignorance, such complete and utter ignorance of these people. But there we are. They are my friends. Um, what can I say? Right. Um, do we have uh, any questions? We will go on talking till this switch is off. Yeah, I think that's what we'll do. Um, exactly. uh, uh, what well, the, one, uh, thing, one thing I should say, uh, which, which, I, which I say in the book, maybe is that, that I had this very happy accident that uh, uh, the Indian, Indian press corps asked me how was I going to advertise, publicize the Gandhi statue. So I said I will go sit there for twenty four hours, uh, <laughs> publicize it, and they they wrote a report saying uh, Meghnath Desa is going on a fast unto death. <laughs> and that in India, Rahul Bajaj called me up and said, what's, what's the matter? I'll give you the money, you know, <laughs> you know, please don't. And I thought that's a very nice, nice mistake they made, which kind of, you know, gave me a lot of publicity and, uh, and help. Uh, and people were very affectionate when they heard that. They said, no, no, I've got to give money, you know. Make that is going to star. The, there is a there is a nice uh, uh, vignette in the book on uh, on your uh, Pravasi Bharti uh, Divas Award uh, and your exchange with uh, with former yeah. uh, Prime Minister, yeah. late Prime yeah. Minister Vajpayee. So maybe you can share that. Yeah, no, it is very interesting because uh, for for one thing that I I only was ask three, three days before it all three or four days before it happened somebody called me about in london and said would you accept an award if the government gave it to you i said of course i will accept they thought oh this money is left wing he will not take a bjp uh, given award i got there and then when i marched to uh, the, the the podium and he put the uh, honor on on my neck and uh, uh, so he says, congratulations. I said, but why did you give the prize to me? I've criticized you so much. So, you know, with, with uh, Vajpayee Ji, when you said something, nothing immediately happened because it was all going to go in there and get translated into Hindi. An answer would be formed, translated in English, come back up. He says, you criticize everybody. But I was very pleased by that, that he knew that while I criticized BJP, I also criticized uh, Congress, C CPM, CPI, whatever it is. I have no party, I have no party political affiliation that way, in, in my opinion. I criticize the Labour Party here. So that is, uh, I'm glad that I have that reputation. I'm not just sold out on one side and can't see the, uh, the defects in my own side and just defects in the opposite side. I'm that way non-partisan. No, I, I think uh, uh, and uh, your uh, uh, your uh, uh, attitude to to say the truth and and the way it is. Uh, in fact, uh, you had to sort of resign from one position uh, in, in John Smith's uh, shadow uh, uh, shadow government. Uh, yeah. uh, and uh, uh, and uh, in fact, you know, at that time you were probably his closest economic advisor on macroeconomic matters. Yeah, I was. No, I think you know, the nice thing is that even in LSE, when there were all these troubles and so on, I always maintain good relationship with all the sides. I've never let personal relations be affected by political. And people are, you know, in India, people have been very, very, very kind of puzzled or critical. Why is he talking to BJP people? Why is he being friendly with Vajpayee? Now they say, why is he being friendly with Narendra Modi? You know, you know. I mean, I am, I, I am the way I am. You know, I will, I criticize Narendra Modi. I have criticized Narendra Modi. I'll criticize, you know, Manmohan Singh. But I'm perfectly happy to be friendly with Manmohan Singh, with Narendra Modi, with whoever, because uh, I don't take 
I don't think that personal relations should be affected by political differences. You know, you always maintain good relationships because that is part of good social behavior. He is not my enemy. I may criticize him, but he's not my enemy. Uh, and uh, so why should I uh, make him an enemy? Mm-hmm. We have differences, but differences are not enmities. Right, right. Um, one uh, one of the, the uh, you you spent uh, some time at the Delhi School of Economics, uh, and that's uh, the interesting pages <laughs> on that uh, written uh, uh, with uh, with uh, with a wry sense of humor, uh, and uh, and and uh, you uh, you you were very grateful to uh, Sukhamoy Chakravarti. Uh, oh, yeah. uh, Great, uh, and uh, as uh, uh, he was, I think, in a way, your mentor when you were uh, when you were there. Absolutely, uh, absolutely. He was he was he was very helpful, and he actually put me on a on a on a path in economic theory, which I would not have gone right. without that. And uh, and of course, you know, we we met several times later. But he was a amazing man, great erudition, very kind person. And sadly, he died young. And of course, he spent a lot of his time in in, in government. Uh, uh, policy advice, but uh, he was a, a spectacularly great theorist uh, at a time when when he was doing theory, and uh, I, I remember very I remember very fondly. Uh, but you know, in 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 Delhi, I, as I said, I I encountered this strange thing in those days of Indian culture that everybody had to pretend to be very left wing, and the higher up you were in government. You were supposed to be more left wing. It is not a left wing government; it's a Congress government. Yeah, you know, and you know, as I as I said, someone said, "Oh, Ashok Mitra has sold out on his Maoist principle," and I said, "What nonsense is this?" For me, being left wing in UK was always being not part of the establishment. You know, you couldn't be the, the chief economic advisor to the UK government and be a communist or sort of you know, that kind of thing. And, but in India, it was very much a done thing. You know, you, yes, you were a minister, you know, you were an advisor, but you were really, really hard left wing. It was kind of a, a play acting. Play, none of them had ever been out and visited a single poor person's house, I tell you. Like I had been canvassing. They had not been anywhere near uh, a slum. They just had this principles. And whenever there was a discussion, only Russian examples were used. Farmers were kulaks. Farmers, farmers were always kulaks. I mean, if, if this thing, what is the farmer's trouble which is happening right now, was happening in 1950s, 60s, these kulaks have to be crushed, you know, and yes, all that. It's sort of play acting, you know, lots, lots of stuff, which is why ultimately the left lost out. They were play acting all the time. Sorry. I mean, say. it's. It- yeah, it's interesting uh, that uh, uh, you know, reading what you have written about the about the California agriculture problem that you were working on, and if yeah. you look at the situation now in India, uh, uh, you know the same four things apply. Uh, you have segmented markets, you have regulation, you have subsidy, uh, absolutely, and yeah. and a public policy. Um, um, yeah. A public policy balance between consumers and producers. Uh, and they, uh, that you know, mo- most farming problems <laughs> encapsulate these four <laughs> concepts. So, yeah. no, and and yeah. also, you know, in a sense, all that's going on is one third of regulations which were beneficial are now being supported under a set of regulations which nobody knows yeah. how they will be. So, you know, that's all this. But that's life, you know. Uh, right. Ultimately, also, I think one one sense you get doing economics and practicing it abroad, that you never, there's a very interesting mix of politics and economics. And if you want to make a change of any kind, say, I'm, I'm, I'm in a social democratic party, I want to make world less honey and so on. Never forget that there are strong, solid reasons for people who don't want to agree with you. And you have to convince them, or you have to overcome them by your by your numbers in election. But you can't ignore them. You can't say, "Oh, I'm going to completely nationalize everything and do this, do that." 
It's not like that. Politics always you have to compromise, you know, adjust, you know, settle for half a loaf and wait for the next chance when you get another, another bit more. And that's what politics is all about. It's a game of compromise. True. Uh, yes, absolutely. Um, one, uh, the one thing that I noticed in your book that uh, about the only entity that got under your goat uh, as an academic were the Cambridge economists. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I mean, that's uh, that's uh, 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 also later on two of your uh, two of your children uh, went up to study at Cambridge, but yeah. but Cambridge economists uh, uh, were. Uh, was something you had a few things to say of the time, yeah. Of the time, but you know, in a sense, uh, I, I wrote something long ago in a, in a in a magazine, Times Higher Education Supplement, which which gets quoted, and I pointed out how Cambridge just got so uh, affected by its own reputation that they thought they had to be uh, doing a revolution of some kind, another Keynes had then a revolution. So Cambridge always had to be in some kind of a big revolutionary stage. And they didn't realize that the subject had moved on and it was much more professional and it was not to do with individual idiosyncrasies and things like that. And I was coming from America. Had I come from India, I would have been very impressed by that. But coming from America, I thought, where are these guys from? Especially the, the dear Joan Robinson, the level, great economist, lovely woman, but she just couldn't understand me. I mean, I had no problem. She just thought I had supposed to be, here I was, I was Indian, I was laughing. Why was I not on her side doing Srafa economics or whatever it was? And I was an applied economist. I wanted to solve problems of life, not problems of theology. Uh, so, uh, but you know, Cambridge did suffer from that very much, and LSE and uh, other places moved on uh, in economics, and uh, I was part of that. Uh, but I thought very idiot, very kind of affected, very aristocratic, elitist behavior, for which there was no need. They weren't that good anyway. We were better. I knew we were That's better right. already by the time I got there. So. Uh, right. I mean, it's a, a lot of time of the profession was wasted on that. Right, right. Yeah, I, yeah, I mean, you... You, uh, you, you, luckily, you luckily never suffer from Cambridge yourself. No, no, <laughs> no. Uh, so... But, no, my, my, uh, children, my children went to Cambridge but did not do economics. I know bo, 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 uh, uh, they, they, they did not uh, do economics. So that's, uh, that's, that's correct. One of the things that, uh, you know, if, if there are students in the, in the audience that I would like to, uh, you know, just share uh, uh, from what I read uh, about their size autobiography uh, is that uh, if you do want to be a good, uh, a good policy person, uh, 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 rigorous, but uh, but uh, uh, but you have you can be rigorous, but you also have to be eclectic. I think it's uh, that's one of the things that uh, that comes out very much in his book, and uh, he deliberately chose to to pursue uh, academically uh, uh, multiple fields in economics, uh, uh, and uh, and he he cites that as one reason why why some of the promotions came a little late in his life but he yeah, he never regretted that uh, uh, and uh, and if you read his book uh, not only this book but his academic articles uh, you will see that um, the sort of uh, uh, applied uh, uh, basis on which he comes uh, to every economic problem uh, is is something that we actually don't do enough um, the uh, the world is of super super specialists now, uh, and yet when these super super specialists suggest a policy solution, people say these are the fifteen things you have not taken into account, and yet those people who actually <laughs> look at things beyond the super super specialization uh, are uh, you know are are, uh, are critiqued as uh, as not being specialized enough. So. That's one of the conundrum uh, that that the economics profession has got itself into. Uh, 
uh, where where the expertise uh, has become uh, has become very specialized and 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 yet and maybe that's one of the reasons that uh, that widely acceptable solutions are becoming more difficult to attain uh, uh, because there are not enough people thinking about it in a in a in a in a in a general equilibrium and broader sense. Uh, so we are almost uh, out of time. Uh, no, I, I'll, I'll uh, if you want to I add something, uh, Lord Besai. Yeah, I did what I did because I enjoyed doing it that way. You yes, know, I, yes. I never rationally calculated, will this get me to the top or not? The next That's problem right. was that I was interested, so I did it. And I enjoyed myself. Through all this, I had a good time doing economics. Right. I mean, that, that, I, permeates through, yeah, that right. permeates through the book, the happiness of, of, of yes, tackling exactly. the kind of academic questions uh, that, uh, that, you, uh, that you worked on. Uh, uh, and... Uh, um, and and um, and that's uh, you know that's uh, that's that's uh, absolutely commendable and something for younger people to strive for. Um, so, is there anything else uh, as an end piece that you would like to say, uh, Lord Desai? I would I would just like to say this: uh, uh, take risks for anybody who's younger. <laughs> you know, take risks and work hard. And enjoy yourself. You know those three things I have done, and I've never regretted it. Uh, and that has taken me to places I would not have been had I been cautious. Had I been cautious, I would have been an IAS, and that is not a bad thing to be. But I've had much more fun not being IAS and being all over the world, enjoying myself. Right. Thank you very much, and read Thank my you. book. Thank yes, you. Yes, I. Much. Yeah, I I, I commend uh, the book uh, wholeheartedly. It, it really is a fine read. So do pick up a copy and uh, uh, and go through it. Thank you very much, Lord Desai. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah. Our next session, my ears with the mouse trap, begins in a short while. Join us for the same at five thirty p.m.